Hi everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be talking about gender and sexuality. In doing that, we will be defining the terms sex and gender. We will be talking about the three core theories of sociology relating to sex and gender. And then we will talk about gender role socialization. So in our language, the terms sex and gender are often used to mean the same thing. Uh, but sociologists and other social scientists, we do make a distinction between those two things. They are, in reality, uh, very different terms, at least the way sociologists use them. Sex refers to an individual's membership in one of two biologically distinct categories, namely being male or female. So when we're talking about sex, we are talking about your biological condition. Are you male or are you female? Now, it should be noted that there are individuals who do not fall into either of these categories in terms of biology. Uh, these people are intersex, uh, and we will talk about them in greater detail later in this unit. Uh, but with all of this said, uh, when we talk about your sex, we're talking about uh, what, what's going on with your body, your physical, biological condition. Gender, then, refers to physical, behavioral, and personality traits that society considers, quote-unquote, normal for male or female members. So, for the vast majority of us, our sex and the, our gender line up, right? Um, for most of us, uh, they, they, they match. But for many of us, they don't. So uh, that, that causes a lot of confusion in this regard. But gender is how you behave, male or female. Um, yeah, so there are different, different things. Sex, we're talking about what your body looks like. Gender, we're talking about your behavior. Now, most sociologists approach the study of gender for, from what's known as a constructionist perspective. So uh, we view gender as being a social construct and acknowledge the possibility that male-female categories are not the only way of classifying individuals. So the way, from this perspective, the way you act male, the way you act female is not due to your biology. Uh, it's not because that's how women are and that's how men are. It's because you as an individual have learned and have been taught how to act male or female in your individual way and there are many different ways to do that uh, another concept we need to be familiar with is gender inequality uh, it can be found in all past and present societies so gender inequality there's no definition here i probably should have put one is the state of uh one gender or the other or another uh to be treated uh, better or worse than the other. Uh, now let's talk a little bit more about how our three core theories uh, view sex and gender. So functionalists believe that there are social roles that are better suited for one gender than the other, and that societies are more stable when certain tasks are fulfilled by the appropriate sex. Um, it should be noted that the functionalist model of uh, gender is very rooted in the mid 20th century, right? So when functionalists were the ones that were in charge in the 50s and 60s, right? And they were the one putting together the theory. As a result of that, uh, that theory reflects the mindsets of that period. Uh, those don't really apply so much to our modern era, right? And they do sound very old fashioned. But that doesn't mean that they're completely um, to be thrown out, because while these ideas of uh, stability and appropriateness of who does what jobs doesn't apply to our modern era, it does help us understand the 50s and 60s, right? It helps us understand why people did those things. And it helps us understand places like Saudi Arabia, uh, and other parts of the world that still do have very distinct, um, very uh, rigid 
ideas of what men and women do. Well, why do people, why do some societies still do that? Why do some people even in our country still do that? Well, part of the reason why they make men's jobs and women's jobs is because it adds a certain kind of comfort to those societies by knowing who's going to do what work, right? There's a certain comfort to, well, who's going to get up and take care of that screaming baby? Well, the woman does that. Um, is that profoundly sexist? Yeah, it is. But there is a reason why people put up with that kind of inequality. Um, and that's what functionalists looked at, pretty much. Uh, so according to Talcott Parsons, who was also a functionalist during this era, men were more suited for instrumental roles, i.e. being the person who provides the family's material support and often served as an authority figure, while women were more suited for expressive roles, namely being the person who provides the family's emotional support and nurturing. Now, again, keep this all with a big grain of salt, right? That from Parson's perspective, he thought that it's because men were this way and women's were this, women were this way. And he's a reflection of his society, right? But we, from a modern perspective, can look at it to mean this way. Men in that society or those societies were allowed to work, right? They were the ones who were allowed to work. They were allowed the ones that were allowed to fix things. And because they were allowed to do that work, they were the ones better suited to do that work. Women, on the other hand, were allowed to show their emotions. They were allowed to effectively put love upon their children and show real emotional love for their children. So thus, because the rules of society were that way, then they were better able to do it that way. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of ickiness in looking at society in this way, and it's deeply problematic. Uh, but uh, this functionalist theory does help us to understand, well, why did they act that way in the city? Why did they act that way in the 50s? Why do they act that way in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan and other parts of the world, right? Conflict theorists uh, match a little better with our modern concepts of how gender works, uh, but they're still slightly off. Uh, conflict theorists believe that men have historically had access to most of society's material resources and privilege, and therefore, it is in their interest to try to maintain that dominant position. So, with conflict theorists, everything, everything, everything is about resources and privilege, right? So, they, from this perspective, view the family as being effectively a mini kind of factory, right? With the father being the owner of the factory, and the father, the mother and children being workers in the factory. Um... And there's, there's a certain accuracy to that, right, uh, in viewing the family as an economic unit. Uh, but this is, again, overly simplistic, too. Uh, so for that reason, uh, we see a real upsurge in feminist social theory uh, when we talk about sex and gender. And the reason why feminist social theory came into being is because... Uh, at least within sociology, that conflict theory really wasn't doing a great job at it. Now, interactionists then emphasize how the concept of gender is socially constructed and maintained and reproduced in our everyday lives. So the interactionist is more interested in, as with all things, how this impacts how you, you do uh, your life. Uh, here we he see an image of a, a male-bodied person uh, applying makeup in a relatively feminine way. His body is male-shaped and sends us a message of who he is. But the way he's behaving, the way he holds his body and holds his face is kind of feminine. Uh, this person is wearing... Um, a flannel shirt, relatively masculine, has a uh, masculine stubble, right? Has his head shaved in a pretty, or their head shaved in a relatively masculine way, but is wearing pearls 
and is applying makeup in a relatively feminine way. Now, from an interactionist perspective, this is a hodgepodge, a mishmash of symbols. We can't tell what's going on here, right? Um, if this person is trying to present themselves in a feminine way, they're not doing it right, right? Because there are too many masculine symbols happening here. If this person is trying to portray themselves in a masculine way, uh, they're doing it even worse, right? This isn't even what drag looks like, right? Because drag is all about being hyper feminine in that certain, those certain ways. And that's not what that looks like, right? And the reason why this is a confusing mishmash of symbols, both masculine or feminine, is because, you know, those do tend to clash, right? And that's part of the in-between space uh, in gender. Uh, and that's what makes this an interesting picture to look at on the slide. Let's talk about gender role socialization, which is a really interesting phenomena uh, within um, gender studies. So gender role socialization is the lifelong process of learning to be masculine or feminine. And this occurs primarily through the four main agents of socialization, namely being family, peers, and the media. We do this thing to children throughout their lives, right? We um, teach them how to be boys, girls, and then men and women. And, you know, in our lives as adults, we also continue the process of learning to be boys and girls and men and women. And there, there's a lot to be said in this regard. Uh, one of the areas where we see heavy gender role socialization is Halloween costumes, right? Um, there's there are so many things I could talk about these three images. Uh, we see a, a masculine lumberjacky kid. Again, with all these kids, you know, you can't tell really obviously because uh, secondary um, sex uh, maturation, right? Adolescence hasn't kicked in yet. Any of these kids could be either masculine or feminine. We have to, boys or girls, right? We can't tell their sex just by looking at them. We have to assume based on how they're presented what their sex is. Let's assume that these are two boys and a girl. This little guy has... Uh, you know, really, you know, he's dressed up as a lumberjack and he has these uh, really tough looking little shoes. And uh, I mean, he's just adorable, really. A uh, little hat, little beard, I presume drawn on um, and a hatchet, right? Very masculine kind of thing. This guy over here has something similar uh, being dressed up as a, uh, a, a gangster era uh, kid, uh, tough guy with a Tommy gun. But I mean, because of the way gender has shifted and this kind of outfit might be more likely to be on a woman than this kind of outfit, this person, this kid might be female. I'm, I'm really not sure. Right. Because that's the in-between space that kids fill. Right. Um, but this kid, this I'm presuming is a girl advertised under girls costumes which is problematic in and of itself there's so much messed up stuff with uh, girls costumes and halloweening i can tell you from having two little girls um she's not allowed to dress up like a pirate like a boy pirate right uh her her uh stuff has to be spangly and glittery and she doesn't have the same pirate outfit that a boy would have um that's because of our a lot of our concepts regarding gender additionally um if she's anything like my daughter she might want that glitter and stuff too right uh it's it's a disservice to people to say well we make women dress this way uh, some women like to dress that way but some men like to dress that way too right there's so much baggage that goes along with our uh conceptions of gender and we put that baggage uh on children uh, and that baggage will continue through their adulthoods. So families are usually the primary source of socialization, and this can greatly impact gender role socialization. So our families teach us how to be in society, and our families also teach us how to be male or female in society. And a lot of the reason, even if we reject what our parents say, and I've said this before, 
uh, we look back to what our parents would think. And it might be that when we look back to how our parents would want, we would do the opposite of that. Well, that's still because of how they socialized you. So that's still them, them having an impact on you. Uh, social learning theory suggests that babies and children learn behaviors and meanings through their interaction and internalize expectations around them. And that this happens from an incredibly early age, right? This happens so young. Uh, my daughter is, uh, at the time of this recording, 18 months old. And she has had this done to her for at least 18 months, right? We say about little little babies, oh, isn't he a tough little guy? Or, oh, oh, isn't she a flirt, right? Things like that that are highly gendered. Well, no, he's not a tough little guy. He's a baby. And if you left him uh, alone for too long, he would maybe get sick and he's not tough in any way. And no, she's not a little flirt. She just pooped while you were holding her. That's not flirting by most definitions, right? Uh, so, no, she's not, right? But we say these things about babies um, because we, that, those are, are, we're projecting onto them what we expect them to be. Schools also socialize us and socialize children. Uh, for instance, uh, research has shown that teachers still treat boys and girls differently. And this may teach our children that there are different expect expectations of them based on their sex. Um, this uh, has changed over time. Uh, when this phenomenon was first identified in the 70s, um, it was very clear that boys were being favored over girls uh, regarding uh, science and technology and that sort of thing. That has changed. Um, but there still are subtle differences in how boys and girls are treated. Um, things like boys being allowed to get away with breaking rules more uh, with saying things like, well, you know, boys, right? That is, that's the same thing. Uh, that is treating boys differently than girls uh, based on our expectations we have of them. In Western societies, uh, peer groups are an important agent of socialization. So, um, for teens, uh, gender role socialization continues. Uh, teens are rewarded by their peer groups uh, when they conform to gender norms, and they are stigmatized when they don't. Now, this has changed a lot in the last couple decades, but we still see this kind of behavior with the grand uh, events of teendom. Uh, the prom, for example, uh, almost always boys are wearing tuxes of a very traditional variety. Almost always uh, young women are wearing uh, dresses that are feminine. And usually these outfits for women are uh, more, they're, they're brighter, right? They're more frilly. They're more showy, uh, which matches uh, what we expect of uh women as opposed to what we expect of men, right? Um, there are so many projects that could be done uh, really breaking down uh, outfits of people uh, going to the prom or other dances for that matter. And there's no question that sexual behavior is portrayed in a highly stereotypical manner in all forms of media. So that includes television, magazines, books, video games, whatever, right? We and now given though also this is this is shifting, right? This is shifting in our society, but still women's bodies are highly scrutinized in our media. You look at that woman on the cover of Fit Pregnancy, she can't be more than the beginning of her second trimester, right? Uh that isn't what many uh pregnant women feel they look like at least, and that's not really what pregnant women typically look like. Um, but look at the guy in men's fitness, right? I, I'm speaking for myself. I'm probably speaking for almost all men that we will never look anything like that. Uh, what I look like when I'm relatively fit is not like that, right? Uh, I look, I look pudgy even when I'm fit, right? Uh, and it applies to both men and women, but it also should be emphasized though that because of the nature of our society, it is much, much harder for women. This is put on women so much more, but we do do it to both. 
One way that we do it so much worse to women uh, is uh, through dolls. And Barbie is the most uh, notorious example of this, but she's by far not the only one. Uh, A problematic part of the Barbie doll is that we are giving a model to little girls of a body that doesn't match what a human body looks like. And that may not have been the intention of Barbie, the people that made Barbie, but it's the reality of what it does to little girls. Studies have have shown over time that girls, especially girls who go on to develop um, body image issues, and especially, especially girls that develop eating disorders, many of those can be traced back to thinking as a little girl well i'm looking at barbie this is what my body is going to look like and if when their body doesn't look like that when they grow up it's because of um barbie uh so here we have a barbie lined up with a healthy young woman and um those two things don't match up now things have gotten better over time uh, one example of this is uh, Frozen, right? If you spent any time with little kids, you're probably relatively familiar with Frozen, even though other movies have come along. Uh, Frozen was said to be, and it is, a relatively feminist message, right? Uh, if you're not super familiar with Frozen, uh, Elsa and Anna, I, I know this really well because of my little girls, Elsa and Anna, um, Elsa is... Uh, she has powers over uh, frozen stuff, right? Uh, ice and stuff. And then Anna is her sister. And the day is saved not when Anna falls in love with the prince. Spoilers for Frozen here. Uh, but when Anna uh, shows her love for her sister, right? So that's not the traditional gender normed um, story that we're used to from uh Disney movies, but there still are issues with Frozen, namely in their body image. We see two versions of masculinity happening here. We see prince masculinity and kind of tougher guy masculinity with Sven. We see um, we see relatively broad shoulders. We see wide wrists. Uh, we don't see the issues with body we see with the women. Namely, that the eyeballs are as wide as wider than the wrists, right? That uh, is an issue that many animated characters have. We don't see that with the males, right? We see strong, thick wrists, right? We see wide bodies. And so these bodies, they don't, of, of the male characters, they, they look relatively you know, normal, healthy. You might expect a human being, you know, to actually look kind of like that. What we're talking about then is uh, the um, bodies of the women, right? This isn't really what a woman's body looks like. Their heads are so much larger than their middle sections, right? Now, given this is a, a, a this is almost what a person looks like, but um, this isn't what, um, it's better than Barbie, but it could be improved. We see the same st- stuff for things geared toward, uh, men, right? Uh, we see, we can especially see that this has gotten worse, uh, over time because you compare old Batman to newer Batman, right? And old Superman to newer Superman. Again, these are a little bit dated, but they'll do the job. And you see, you know, these these abs and these chiseled pecs, and we as adults know that this is sculpted plastic, of course, but little kids don't necessarily recognize that. And when you look at this Batman, he's, he's a pudgy mess, right? Well, these are pretty fit guys. Uh, George Reeve, he was considered to be the most fit man in America during his Uh, heyday this superman right he was a bodybuilder this was what a really fit guy looked like but he looks like a total tubub compared to this superman um so we do it to both boys and girls uh but i have to emphasize we do it way 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 worse to girls than we do to boys 
but we do do it to both. Okay, that is it for this lecture, and uh, we will talk more about this stuff uh, later.